Hello, and welcome to RT Sidebar, a podcast by respiratory leaders for respiratory leaders. Today's episode is a live recording from October 13th, where respiratory therapists ask our host questions on staffing. For respiratory real world advice, stay tuned. I'm Anna Hayes, and I'll be facilitating the sidebar, the chat, the accompanying dialogue, where you can introduce yourselves and comment about what you want to hear tonight. And let me know what your questions are that you might have for our host. The intention of this event is not to be a didactic lecture, but rather a dynamic dialogue. While our hosts speak uh, to a specific topic at each event, feel free to ask some questions that you might have on respiratory leadership or management. Now, let me hand it over to our three hosts, Matt Pelvichko, John Walsh, and Jonathan Butler to introduce themselves and the topic for this week's event. Matt? Thanks, Anna. Um, my name is Matt Pavlichko. I've been a respiratory leader for over 25 years. I uh, spent a lot of my time in different hospitals in Pennsylvania, North Carolina. Um, I'm an active member of AARC, PSRC, led many different initiatives clinically, educationally and managerially. Um, I love my field of respiratory care, but I will tell you when I first got into leadership, I didn't have a lot of help. I had a couple of mentors. It was helpful, but I had to learn a lot along, along the way. Jonathan, you and I've talked about it quite a bit. So Jonathan, I'm going to introduce, I'd like to hand it over to you, talk a little bit about, about, about you and, and all the great stuff that you've learned over the years um, and how tough it was to, to be an initial leader. Hey, my name is Jonathan Butler. I've been in healthcare for about 23 years, uh, 19 of which have been in the field of respiratory. Uh, I've held every position you can in respiratory from bedside, supervisor, coordinator, manager, clinical supervisor, all the way up to director. So I've uh, been in every role. Um, Background from clinical or uh, background from education. I, I did, of course, my degree in respiratory, and then I did my undergrad, graduate in, uh, business administration because I have a, a, a fetish for uh, student loans and uh, huge payments. I got a doctorate in uh, healthcare administration. So we've all been in these leadership roles, and uh, our whole goal here is. We get you all that so you don't have to. So we're here to just kind of walk you through. We're not here to have PowerPoint presentations. This is real life experience. I'm going to tell you exactly how I got yelled at and how I got out of it so you don't have to. So this is something that I've always felt a need to uh, have for our, our field because we are the redheaded stepchildren of the department of the hospital. Uh, we don't really get the support we need, so we're coming to you as a, as a, a group to be that community and, and get the conversation started in a safe environment so you're not getting yelled at. Um, but yeah, this, this really gets me excited. I mean, anytime I'm in the hospital, I could be walking down the hallway. If I hear the word respiratory, it catches my ear. I'm going to turn around and figure out who it is and what they're talking about, and I want to be involved. So anything respiratory, I'm there. So I'm going to hand it off over to my uh, colleague John Walsh, and let him talk about himself. Hey, everybody. How are you doing? And welcome uh, to joining us tonight. Uh, uh, as you can tell, my guests have more degrees than a thermometer. Uh, but unlike them, I never got yelled at at work. So uh, I guess we got the two bad boys and the one angel here. Uh, but I, too, have been a, uh, in the field of respiratory therapy now for about 25 years. Uh, a handful of those years, I was working as a director in post-acute care. I also have experience in uh, acute care medicine, uh, and before I moved over to industry, uh, worked in emergency medicine. Uh, but uh, in the last 21 years, I've had the fortunate uh, uh, experience of working with really all of you out there, uh, both domestically and internationally, uh, working with hospitals as healthcare has evolved, uh, clinical practice has evolved, Things have changed both in the respiratory department as well as outside the respiratory department. And I've been working with a lot of RT directors as well as therapists uh, through those changes. So I hope to add some insight and to help some of our uh, listeners and those that come on uh, kind of navigate through those changes much like we had to, uh, but with little guidance uh, as, as we've seen. And obviously over the last couple of years, uh, both uh, in the clinical setting and outside, 
the world of respiratory therapy in itself has changed significantly. So as a couple, couple things uh, that my guests or uh, my colleagues rather had alluded to is really what this podcast is about is bringing you real world advice. Now we're gonna do that by bringing on guests uh, from different avenues of healthcare backgrounds. Maybe it's inside respiratory, outside of respiratory, but we're gonna bring those people in and we're gonna have conversations and we're gonna share uh, not only some of our questions and thoughts with those individuals, but this podcast is going to be interactive. And what we mean by that is there is a chat available that we're gonna be monitoring and we welcome uh, any and all activity on that chat, whether it be in the form of a comment or a question, we may even throw some polls on there to get some ideas, engage uh, if what we're talking about uh, resonates with the audience. Uh, lastly, we may be doing live events. Uh, you know, we have the AARC coming up, so we're going to be uh, potentially broadcasting this podcast from different events uh, across the country, uh, whether it be in the form of a conference, convention, maybe something's going on out there at a state or local regional event that you'd like us to do this podcast from, we'd be more than happy to support the state societies as well. Now, this is going to be a safe place for learning. Uh, it's unfiltered friends and mentors, and that's what we want. We want to help build the respiratory therapy profession. And uh, some weeks it may be just me, it may be just two of us, it may be all three of us, but you can guarantee that we're going to bring the most interesting topics, uh, the, the timely topics, and the ones that are meaningful uh, to you the most at the time. The cool thing is, is we've got the West Coast covered with Jonathan Butler coming in from California. We got the East Coast coming in with Matt Pavlichko uh, in Philadelphia. And I'm right in the heartland in Nashville, Tennessee. So we're going to be able to bring you coast to coast, uh, everybody that's coming in with ideas. Now, the one thing that we kind of want to start off with is a topic uh, for this inaugural uh, podcast uh, is something that's probably come up a lot for a lot of you uh, as of late, and, and that is the topic of staffing. Now, when you bring up the subject of staffing, there's a lot to this, right? There's hiring, there's the coaching, there's the retention, uh, there's uh, how to interact with the staff. But what we want to do with this particular session is start the conversation from the point of view of a brand new RT director. And I've seen this, I've watched the Facebook respiratory break rooms and a few other chat groups where a lot of questions have come up, guys, lately, especially as people are retiring or they're moving to other locations there are director positions open now. And we have a lot of people out there that have maybe never interviewed for a position like this before or have even thought that they might be ready for it. So Matt, I'm gonna to come to you first. When, uh, when you look back on taking on a department as a brand new RT director, uh, what are some of the things that come to mind that might help somebody who's maybe thinking about that position or what they might want to uh, consider before taking on that position? Uh, th th thank you, John. I appreciate it. Uh, it it's a tough question. And it's an evol and it's evolved a little bit. Think about it. So back in the day when uh, when I first became a manager director, I literally I just wanted the title. That's all it was. And we had plenty of staff and everything was good. I was probably more worried about if I can get new ventilators or not. Today's a different world. Okay. And when you walk in and you're thinking about a new directorship or new manager, you've got to be thinking people. You got to be thinking it because you might be walking into a new uh, a new department and it's well staffed or it's not. It could be a disaster. You don't know. So probably the biggest question is for the my future boss. What kind of support are they going to give me? And the second question would probably be to the staff. How's it going in this department? I think that's a really important piece because, you know, John, you and I talked about it, Jonathan, we talked about this as well. It's not just them interviewing you, it's now you interviewing them. And I think that's probably the biggest thing. Uh, Jonathan, you and I were talking about this recently is you've, you've managed five different departments. What other questions would you have asked? I think that's probably the biggest thing for me is I would ask something specific to people. Would you do the same thing? Yeah, I agree with that. I mean, uh, if I would have had someone as a mentor just stop me before I walked into my interview and said, hey, you need to ask as many questions of them as they ask of you, I wouldn't have got it at the time. But now that I've gone through it, I definitely would have asked a lot more questions. 
One being which, you know, am I budgeted to take on new uh, new applicants, right? So can I hire if, if I can? If I can't, then what do I do, right? So I understand from the executive standpoint that they want you to run efficiently before you start asking for staff. But when you're a new director, you're in that honeymoon phase. And in that honeymoon phase, you can ask for quite a bit. So that's good for about a year. So if in that first year, <laughs> you're going to want to staff up a lot. But if they're going to stop you from the get-go, you're going to have to be efficient. And when you go in, do you know how to become efficient? And, and then how do you keep staff from leaving? Because when I first came into leadership, I would open up a per diem position or a PRM position, depending on where you're at in the country. And I would get 90 applicants. I don't think that happens anymore. And so if that, if you're going to open positions, where, where are you going to get these people? Can you open positions? There's so many questions that need to be asked uh, before you go into that role. Uh, so M Matt, I mean, what, what would questions you would want to ask when you're going in? So um, first things, you know, really understanding my new leader is an important piece. Understanding the leadership that you have underneath you. I've been blessed having great leadership underneath me that manages the day to day. I didn't know I had that when I took my last job, but I did. I think what I would have done and what I did do a little bit is during staff interviews, I, I wanted the staff to interview me because then I could interview them. How are things going? How do you measure productivity? What does your workload look like? Oh, I have 25 ventilators yesterday. That's not a good situation. And you're, but you know what? I mean, you laugh, Jonathan, but that's how it was back in the day. We used to have 25 okay. vents. John, you remember those, those days, they were terrible, yep. but you know, to really understand what the day-to-day -day looks like, I think was really important. So you act, you have to ask strategic questions and those strategic questions cool. to understand that current state is important. John, you go throughout the country and you've probably walked into more hospitals than I even know exists. Is this consistent that leaders understand what they're getting into when it comes to staffing or is it just hey i'm a good respiratory therapist and we're going to elevate you to a position that you might not be prepared for yeah and i think um i think a lot of it has to do with whether you're applying for this role externally or internally right um obviously if you're coming in internally you know a lot of the uh uh, the the going on uh, of what the department day to day operational, and I would say that you know in order to prepare for a role like that, if you're in the hospital and you're aspiring to be a director, and I've seen this in a few other hospitals, take take yourself and put yourself under the wing of of somebody above you. Learn the job above you. Learn the job below you, and and follow that director to a budget meeting. Follow that director to a quality improvement session follow that director and just sit in the back of the room and take notes and learn because that's really the best exposure. And if your leader is going to give you that opportunity and take the time to do it, take full advantage of it. And I've seen recently, as a matter of fact, three or four directors, newly minted directors that have moved up because they took advantage of those situations. I think if you're externally hiring for a role like this, number one, you know, when I, when I look for candidates to come on uh, to when I interview, it is not so much are they a good fit for us, but are we a good fit for them? So I think going back and reviewing things like that you would overlook, go to their website, review the mission of the hospital. What are the quality uh, measures of the hospital? How do they measure themselves? What is their role within not just the healthcare system, but the community? What types of patients do they treat? And that kind of helps prepare you for when you go in for that interview. I think the biggest thing here, guys, is what I'm hearing is, is kind of preparing those questions. Because for me, if I'm interviewing somebody, I really want them to come to me with questions because it makes me feel as if though they've taken the time to research the position, they want to know more about it, uh, and, and they've, they've thought it through, right? They've put enough thought into it to, to put the questions down. So, so for me, one of the things... Um, uh, Jonathan, if, if we were to help our group here, what would be one question uh, at, at, at your former position that you would want an RT director to come in and ask you to make you feel as if though they're, they're really interested in this job? 
if I was going to be the hiring manager for the RT director? Yeah, if somebody was coming in to interview for an RT director's job, what question would you want them to ask? Or what question would you recommend an RT director ask? That is a good question because I had I, I hired an RT director in my last position. And, and really, it, it, it's how the department runs. Uh, there's big variances. And if it's a, uh, a bargaining department, like, a.k.a. a union department, because mm -hmm. then you got a CBA you got to deal with as opposed to just policies and procedures. There's huge variances there. So you have to know the lay of the land. And so if I'm the hiring manager and I have an RT director coming in, I would actually appreciate a director that's going to ask me, what is the lay of the land? How does this department function? How does the hospital function? Uh, what role do I get to play in, in the department and the decision making? Because then mm -hmm. you know that th that person has that experience because uh, often I'll, I'll run into someone who wants to go from bedside all the way to director. And that's such a giant leap. Uh, and I'm not knocking anyone that has done that because you can be successful, but it is, it is a big leap when you go from today, I'm giving handheld nets to tomorrow. I'm trying to do, figure out the budget of a department. So to, to understand how the department works in the staffing, it is, it's, a, it's a big difference. And, and those are the, the questions that you want to know uh, going in because you're gonna, your game plan will swing wildly different one direction to the other depending on the layout of that department. So Matt, have you, uh, have you been on both sides of that where you have both a, a, a bargaining agreement department and a non-bargaining agreement department and how those run differently? Because staffing is a big part of that too. I, I, I have it, to be honest. Um, I've always had non-union shops, uh, but one of the things that comes to me is the people, right? How are the people being managed? So whether it's union or non-union, you know, it's really managing a group of, you know, Jonathan, you've had big departments, you know, you're managing a hundred, a hundred people, you know, like, like that's a lot of people. And it's not just managing them as, as marks on your, on, on your schedule, but they're people, you know what I mean? They're people. So like, get, like getting to know them and doing those things, I think is really important. One of the things that John asked that is important to me is how does respiratory affect the greater good? So probably the question I would ask my hiring manager is what are your priorities of the hospital and where does respiratory fit in? If there is no answer to that question, that's a red flag to me because you're not thinking about respiratory therapy being a part of the, the greater good. That would worry me greatly. So to me, and I, I've, I've said this a million times, 70% of your budget is people. Do you spend 70% of your time on your people? So do you have that opportunity to do that? Is this the place, just like John said, uh, am I a good fit? Does my philosophy fit with the greater good of the hospital is really important. So th that's kind of where, where I'm at. Um, it, it is challenging. the The union shops or not? I, I just I just don't know, Jonathan. I know you've been pro and con uh, of that, and you've seen both sides. Uh, you would have a a much better opportunity with that and understanding. All right, our hosts. That is a great discussion. Um, we do have one question in the chat here from Josh Good. Uh, Josh, would you like to talk to our host and ask your question directly? Josh, good in the house. Um, so, sorry, I was looking for the unmute button there. Hey, thanks for joining so, us. Sorry. I hey, thought Josh. I was just going to get off easy with the chat here. I didn't know I had to talk. You're on the hot seat. <laughs> nope, that's all, all good. So, Jonathan, you mentioned a little earlier about making sure that you uh, have the option of making departments run efficiently. So, if you're in a place where you either, one, are not given the opportunity to hire new therapists if you're a new director or you cannot find them what are some of your secrets to making sure you're running efficiently uh i mean it, it's a long drawn out process uh to run efficiently one you want to make it as automated as possible one of the things that i find is you don't want clinical staff doing anything with finances so what you do is you have it on built on the back end of your electronic medical record. So anytime they document, it's just dropping charges because if it's 
the staff required to document and then manually drop charges, guarantee you're not going to drop charges. There's going to be 40% that are going to fall through the cracks. You had a busy shift. You did CPR all the way until the end of the shift. You know what? I'm too tired to bill. I'm just going to go home. And so anytime that happens, those are productivity units that are not going to get added to the department. So you did the work, you staffed it, but yet when you come to the finance side of things, nothing came across. In finance, they're a bunch of bean counters and you need to give them beans to count. If they're not counting beans, then they're just thinking, well, you guys aren't doing anything over there. So there's a lot of that uh, as far as uh, staffing the shift. Yeah, you can do your point system. I, I like the ARC 15 minute increment point system. That's really good. But on the back end of that shift, you got to make sure that everyone's going out uh, or actually leaving the shift uh, at 100% productivity. So just those two things alone are, are big. And uh, there's a little different variances too. I mean, you can do like concurrent therapy. And I'm not talking about stacking treatments, but if you document maybe a ventilator check, a handheld nebulizer, pulse ox, uh, you know, whatever, all in the same row at the same exact time, that's what's considered concurrent therapy. So you may have done four procedures, but when finance counts that, that's one bean as opposed to four. And you would want to split those up, but just little changes like that. And all of a sudden you're a productive unit. And so when you go to finance and you're asking for FTEs, then they say, well, you know, you're over hundred percent productivity. It makes sense. We'll give you the staff. So that, that's kind of what I do. Matt, you do anything similar like that in your departments? Uh, absolutely. So uh, EHR um, efficiencies are important, okay? Respiratory therapists doing non-respiratory therapy work is silly. It just is. And, and that's clicking in, in that damn e e EHR. Click here, click here, click here, click here, just to make sure charges are dropping. You know, respiratory therapists are clinicians. They're, they're doing CPR, just like you said. You know, and oh, it's time to go. I'm 15 minutes late to get home to my kids. Charting it is just not on their radar. It's just not. It's just. It's just how it's going to be. Other anything that's non-respiratory related, get rid of it. Probably one of the best things that I have seen is get equipment techs. You get young respiratory therapy students. You get young people that are thinking about wanting to get into healthcare. Let them clean vents. Let them calibrate them. Hey, I need a bronchoscope in in the ICU. Can you bring it to me? And it arrives. Walking is a gigantic waste of time for a respiratory therapist. So efficiencies, especially during COVID, that we we had to be efficient. We had no choices. But I feel like making sure you have the right people doing the right work at the right time is important. Now, I don't think that happens everywhere. John, he, like I said, you walk into more hospitals than I even know exist. I'm sure you see a lot of inconsistencies there too, that some people are, you know, not as efficient as others. So do you see that? And does it really, does it affect the overall health of the department when they're not being as efficient? Yeah, I mean, because then uh, based on what I've seen, it, it causes stress within the department. Um, and then you find yourself, you know, respiratory therapists like to exercise that respiratory muscle, right? They like to be free thinkers and, and really apply what they've learned in school or apply within their profession. And this can be uh, damning for an RT director who's trying to keep a cohesive department together, especially if the department feels as if though they're not, um, you know, being utilized to their fullest potential. Um, and so based on, based on that, I think this is ensuring that not only from a uh, holistic uh, point of view in terms of assuring that you have the correct amount of staff, but to ensure that the staff that is there is being utilized to their fullest potential and they feel like they are, right? That's an important piece, John. I've always said a respiratory therapist is as good as every doing that they don't give. Right. Exactly. So much junk and BS that we give that's just absolutely not necessary. And you don't feel very valued when you're giving unnecessary care. I mean, mm -hmm. and, and then it snowballs into that redheaded stepchild mentality, you yep. know, and, and you see good departments and you see those departments that feel that way. So, yep. So if we take a step back guys and, and think about, 
when we entered this and talking about a, a new RT director, both of you mentioned a lot of um, uh, whether the credentialing or the degrees you have. If uh, if you have somebody, and, and and two, we understand there's different levels of of uh, uh, hospitals, right? Um, across across the board. If if you had somebody walking in to become a director uh, at at any given time or any given hospital, what sort of uh, credentialing or background would you recommend in terms of education uh, to help that RT director kind of prepare for those roles? Because you were talking a lot about budgeting and finance and all these other things. Um, obviously, they're credentialed as a respiratory therapist, but how, how can we prepare them uh, or they prepare themselves for that kind of role? Hey, actually, John, great, great question. Sorry to cut you off here. I think Joe Garcia actually has some thoughts on this topic. So I, I do want to pass the mic to him for, for a moment here. Uh, uh, Joe, would you like to introduce yourself? Uh, hi, thank you. Um, yeah, my name is Joe Garcia. I'm the uh, market director for a hospital group in the Central California region. And I also consult on the side regarding productivity in reimbursement and also a global support staff for a lot of departments across the United States as, as well. Um, I kind of wanted to go backwards um, a little bit on the topic uh, just, just previously about what was asked on the uh, chat about uh, when we do, when, when a department does not have enough staff and they need to run efficient. Some, one thing I've, I've learned myself as being a director uh, both locally and nationally, is I kind of use a SWAT acronym, and you look for sustained waste, opportunity, and threat, but more so the person, the waste, and opportunity. And as to uh, uh, the previous comments about what you need to assess is, you know, I always build a budget from, you know, do we always meet patient care needs? That, that's how you should always build your budget, is meeting, meeting patient care needs. But what I've identified is a waste and um, something you have to look at is what are our licensed therapists doing uh, that, that is considered a waste. And um, it was mentioned about, are they involved in some sort of non-respiratory duty that's pulling away hours? Those, those hours equal you know, labor hours, which correlate to your budget. And one must step back and almost do a tracer on those waste areas. And most of the time, those can be allocated to another uh, cost center or another department. And so that's just one area where I begin to uh, start out with this kind of a global analysis of uh, within our licensure, sustain, you know, waste opportunity. And we always want to grow our service line and then that will piggyback off of when, once we reduce the waste, we begin to add service line within our scope of practice to meet our patient care needs. That, that, that's fantastic, Joe. Really appreciate that. Um, it, it, it's really about value, right? And the value of the respiratory therapist is in question today. Um, and, you know, in, ensuring we get the most amount of value out of the respiratory therapist helps the department grow, but it also is the greater good. So I think, I, I think that's an important piece. Jonathan, you and I talk about value quite a bit, uh, you know, talk about the value equation, talk about, you know, how we can really support respiratory therapists. I think Joe has an important piece. You know, it's not about how much stuff you can do, but how much, how much outcome you can produce. And, and that is a good point. I mean, there are uh, proceed. I mean, anything that's non-clinical, you want to get off the respiratory department. So if it's equipment or even staffing or not staffing, uh, supplying the floors with stock, right? So one thing that I did in my last hospital, I, I went to materials management and I said, hey, you know, I got some people that are making quite a bit of money putting supplies on shelves. How about you guys do this for us? And they had no problem with it. They didn't even know that it was an area that they weren't supplying themselves. So little tweaks like that. But I, I can't agree with Joe Moore. If, if you're, you got to make sure that you're meeting the needs of the patients, and that's priority number one. That's the if we're not there for that, we're not there for anything. Um, you you know. But there are things like bronchodilator protocols out there that can kind of get rid of the waste, then that frees you up for the patients that actually need you. Uh, you know because. I would, I would see, you know, a patient comes in, never had a treatment before in their life and they're Q4 around the clock. 
let's do a bronchodilator protocol, make them PR and just in case they wheeze, but we should not be spending all that time on that patient when we got ventilators that need to be weaned or, or ARDS that needs to be managed. There's a lot of, of, of waste that takes us away from our core competence and that's it's treating patients in respiratory distress and respiratory failure. So that's kind of what I see. But John, when, when, when you're going into all these uh, departments. I mean, you, you've you been in more departments than Matt and I combined. What do you see as, as their number one priority? In terms of the respiratory department themselves? Yeah. Um, patient care. Uh, and I think if they're focused on that uh, and that's their number one priority, then you can't go wrong, right? Those closest to the patient wins. I think Kara brings up a good point in the chat about respiratory therapy driven protocols. Uh, I think in, in some regard that that saves a lot of uh, what we're talking about, both in terms of is respiratory getting to flex their muscle and, and apply what they've learned and taught uh, and also making the uh, hospital run more efficient. Think about how many phone calls, and, and I know we're getting kind of in the weeds, but every minute adds up to an hour, every hour adds up to a day, and then before long, you know, you've wasted a lot of time, but think about a therapist that can make a clinical decision at the bedside, write the order, that the action happens immediately without phone calls, pages, tracking down somebody, waiting for the phone call to come back. And you could wait up to six or seven hours just to make a ventilator change when it could be done right then and there. And think about how many hours that takes off a patient being on a vent if we can, and I know that's just one little thing, but when you, when you apply therapist-driven protocols across the entire continuum of care within the department and the hospital, that adds up to patient days, which then can add up to a bigger impact to the bottom dollar for the hospital financially, you know, fiscally. So I've always been a big fan of respiratory therapy-driven protocols. I do think they make the respiratory departments run more efficiently. Uh, I've worked in hospitals where we wrote the orders and we made the decision there. And I've worked in hospitals where we didn't. And, um, and I can tell you that for those that do, uh, tend to have a little more cohesive and the culture and a department that has therapist driven protocols is a lot different culture than those that don't. Uh, and I'm not saying one's right or wrong, but I'm just saying based on observations, they, the, the impact of therapist driven protocols is to be more efficient. Right. I think that's an important piece, John. You said you said something really, really important there. So it 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 better's patient care, mm -hmm. and it helps your staffing. So mm -hmm. Kara's putting it in, put that chat in there, and say that makes me feel more autonomous. That makes me feel more valued. That makes mm -hmm. me not want to leave. That's an important piece. So we're driving patient care, but we're also driving teammate satisfaction. That's huge, and that's money. There's dollars behind that. And okay. those dollars are really, really important. So they're like, hey, I don't have time to create a new protocol. You need to make time because that stuff matters. That stuff absolutely matters. Good job. Yeah. Kara, thank you so much for being here tonight. Is what our host saying resonating with you personally? It is, definitely. And, um, you know, I haven't been at the bedside for um, some years now, but it's still the same conversation that we had when I was at the bedside. So you're always worried about staffing. You're always worried about efficiency and quality. I think it resonates. It's it's just a timeless conversation, right? And for me, when we're having this conversation, therapist-driven protocols immediately comes top of mind because you're able to save money. You're bringing value to um, the department. You're showing your value to the pulmonologist, the specialists that you work with, the nursing staff. I mean, how many times, I can't even tell you how many times I've gone in and I've listened to a patient that had Q4 respiratory um, albuterol treatments, they were clear. And it's like, why are we doing this? We're killing ourselves. I've got 50 treatments, I've got 10 vents, I've got, and I'm running to ER. We could stop this. And so the therapist-driven protocols empower you to say, okay, look, <laughs> I'm going to stop this now. I'm going to make it PRN or what have you. And I can focus on patients that do need me. And it allows you to flex your muscle as a respiratory therapist and use all of the training that you were given because 
you were trained to do a lot more than just give breathing treatments. You were able to assess patients and recommend treatments. And so it, it opens up a whole new world um, for, for that, for saving money and showing value and staff. I mean, we were able to actually send people home <laughs> that we didn't need because you don't need to be doing 50 different things. Yep. And I think, Kara, this brings up a good point. And for, for everybody listening and, and is going to be watching this, you know, when we talk about managing an RT department and leading and coaching people within that department, we've already brought up three or four, maybe five topics tonight that we, we could make a, an entire topic out of one show. Uh, productivity, uh, building the developing culture within an RT department. Um, how to build respiratory therapy driven protocols, right? Because those just don't happen overnight. Uh, that in itself is a process and may be driven by a quality improvement project, for example. So these are all things that um, as, as you're watching and listening and ideas come to mind, please send them in because these are gonna be great topics down the road to really dive deep into. And quite frankly, just on some of these things that we talked about tonight, we could probably spend at least one or two episodes on really diving into. Uh, so I think that's uh, from a financial aspect uh, to a, a, a leadership aspect, coaching. Uh, these are all very important topics for sure. I, I agree, John. Uh, I want to come back to the one thing that you asked for, the, what type of credentials and, and things that you should have. Mm -hmm. What you need to do as a respiratory leader more than anything is to stop and listen. You have great people around you. If you just listen, They'll tell you the answer. Kara just told, told us the answer. Hey, if we have more respiratory therapy driven protocols, we're gonna have a better department. Hey, if we manage uh, waste better, we'll have a better department. So I think that's kind of the essence of this podcast, isn't it? It's not only just to talk, but it's also to listen. It's not a lecture. That's the point of this is that we can talk and we can listen to like-minded people and learn from one another because leadership is lonely. Jonathan, you and I have talked about that a lot, that, you know, you just feel like uh, like you're on an island by yourself and you might have some great people, but still you feel alone. So that's where I think that this podcast can really go. Jonathan, I, <laughs> you and I had some good times in Maryland having this exact discussion. You know, what are your thoughts? You know, I love where John's going with this. Where do you think that this podcast should go? Where do you think it provides the greatest value? It is. It's getting away from the didactic PowerPoints that just put you to sleep. This is just normal conversations. Uh, you know, it's, it's a play on words, but, you know, this is if you were at a bar with a bunch of other RT directors, what would you guys have a conversation about? These are the types of conversations and at that level that we want to have and, and give you the support because you know, when I, when I first got into leadership, some of my best meetings were in elevators or walking down the hallway. They weren't in meetings. Uh, you know, I wasn't watching a PowerPoint presentation on productivity or anything like that. I was walking down the hallway. I got on the elevator with somebody and we're talking. And I, 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 that's probably where I learned most of what I know now is on an elevator in a hallway or, you know, I stopped by someone's office because they didn't email me back and I get really uh, OCD on that type of thing. So I'll just stop in and say hi. Uh, but you know, those are those candid conversations that really are meaningful. And so that's what this whole thing is, is that we want to have these conversations in a safe environment. Uh, and you can ask anything. Uh, if we don't know the answer, we have such a large reach that we can get that answer back to you somehow. Uh, but that, that's kind of where I, I, I see this going. And it's, it's just a, an added bonus to our, our profession that we have people that want to come together and help. Uh, I don't know if the other professions have it, but this is a much needed for the respiratory realm. I'll tell you that. I wish I would have had so a podcast like this about 10 years ago. I'd probably be a lot further down the road in my profession right now if I did. So that's kind of how I see it. Uh, going back onto that question, as far as uh, what would I like to see as far as education backgrounds, I don't put my, my, uh, love for student loans on anyone else. I would say just a bachelor's degree is fine. Uh, uh, it, it just shows that you put a little extra effort into growing yourself to get into a higher role. 
that's all you really need. Um, but that, that I wouldn't say anything more than that. I mean, if you want to, great, and it, it, it can't hurt you. I mean, the more paper you have on uh, behind your name, the better. Uh, but bachelor's, i say, is a good entry level. What do you think, Matt or John? Yeah, I, I, I agree. Um, initials behind your name does get you into the door. It does. Um, it's a joke in, in our house. My wife has like 15 more initials behind her name than I do. <laughs> It does. It gets you in the door. Um, yes. and, but things like this, like listen to a podcast, that's growth and development. You know, you know, uh, going on a webinar, understanding, seeking out information, taking a class. It's all opportunities mm -hmm. for you to learn and grow. And that's, uh, you know, that, that's the essence of this. I think it's the essence of what we're trying to create is because starting from scratch sucks. It just mm -hmm. does. And I know John, Jonathan, I know you pretty well, Joe, you and I've got a chance to talk a couple of times. You started from scratch too, you know, and it's not fun. I know Josh Good's on here. He's, he started from scratch um, to have somebody that you can talk to and somebody that can point you in the right direction goes a long way. And I think that's the essence of this podcast and what makes me excited to talk about it. Cause that's what leadership is, is, is really camaraderie. So I think it's yep. awesome. Well, I'm glad we're on here. So uh, Jonathan doesn't have to ride as many elevators now to learn stuff. So that's the best part about it for me. Now, um, I, I know we're coming up on uh, about 15 minutes left in the podcast. And, uh, you know, just to kind of end on a on a topic uh, where and this may be a loaded question for the group. And, and Joe, maybe maybe you could add to this, too, because you're you're still boots on the ground as far as uh, RT directors go. But where do you see RT directors and the role of an RT director now heading uh, post COVID? You know, I mean, pre COVID uh, uh, to now, I see departments evolving. Um, you know, prior to COVID, uh, RT directors, uh, because they are managing a cost center, uh, were having difficulty getting POs cut for some of the simplest of things. And it seemed for almost two and a half years, they had a blank check to buy whatever they needed. And now, obviously, it looks as if, though, just out of coming out of that, you know, things are going to start getting back to normal somewhat. So where do you guys think that the RT director role as a whole is headed in the next uh, five years? This is Joe. Ahead, oh, Joe. Yeah. yeah, it's a good question. Probably can I can spend probably or all of us can for an hour on this topic that I'm going to bring up. but. Um, yeah, it took COVID or, or actually a pandemic to have the profession somewhat uh, noticed, unfortunately. Um, and uh, now we see, um, thank God that uh, things are decreasing, hopefully back to normal, normal soon. But um, I, I wanna talk about what the word value. It was mentioned already before a couple of times on this live broadcast. And yes, we do see value uh, or the clinician does at the ground level from a patient uh, improving. We can convey that to a physician, et cetera. What I've learned is that then we have to take the value and so I'm, I'm going to, to your question, we have to sustain what we have earned during COVID right now. I said, that's a key thing. How do we sustain it? But the key thing is to uh, everything which we talked about, about patient driven protocols to eliminate not only um, the clinical waste, if you will, but also the non-clinical waste to have the right budget built. But we have to sustain the value that we earned over the last three years. And, it's, and it does start at the ground level, but one must, as a leader, you must have to know value on what the A team looks at on their screen, what quality of metrics they, they look at. If you learn that, then me, I, I can go and talk to a CNO, CFO, any A team member, and knowing what they look at a little bit differently than what they what we see at the ground level, begin to make a case that I added value in this quality metric or core measure. They begin to posture up and say, "Well, tell me more," and I do tell them more and begin to give them data to see if I have the appropriate staffing, if you will, the appropriate devices, you know, go so on and so forth. I can make an impact either via DRG, a core measure, a quality metric, patient who's septic, uh, all, every, everything that we hear about that's on the top five radar of healthcare, 
we need to do better at not only adding value at the ground level, but teach leaders how to then twist that cover to 180 and present it to the executive team. And that's where you get your wins and your buy-in and they, oh, you are value, you are making an impact. And you will get your more FTEs because you need more time to spend with, this, with these patients that are high, higher acuity or whatever the case may be. Um, I think we, we can spend you know, two podcasts on how to, how to look at a value differently. I, I, and Joe, to be honest, <laughs> we might just be tapping you on the shoulder for that one. Value is important. Jonathan, we talked about value. You know, where do you see value in the future? Where, where do you see for leaders and for therapists? Uh, I mean, following COVID, um, I would say more on the emergency management side of things because it, it, it just so happened to be that November of 2019, I went to an Ebola conference in, in downtown LA and, and the, the, the final PowerPoint presentation slide says the worst virus is the one we don't know about. And about four weeks later, my first COVID patient rolled into the hospital and I, it was, you know, you got to hit the ground running. You had to come up with all these flows, but then you also have to manage with not having the things that you need and where are you going to go find these things? And, and then setting up tents outside and, and now I'm, I'm, I'm doing things and, uh, and it's like, well, I've never learned this in school at all. Uh, and, and now because I, I, I ran, I ran all this stuff. I, I set up the tents. I, I worked on the flow. I, I was the, the head on, on finding PPE. I worked with LA County and, and trying to get stuff out of the port, but it, it, it's being that, that missing piece during a disaster that what makes you very, very valued. Uh, and then my staff were just, I, I mean, they were phenomenal. So it, it, it's really, who's going to be there when it counts? Uh, and can you be that person? Can you run that department where it's not you showing up by yourself? Everybody in your department shows up as a response. Uh, that's who you want in an emergency because when everyone else is stepping back, you want to be that one person who steps forward. And that's where you're going to get that value uh, add to the hospital and the organization is you want to be there when you're needed the most. I mean, that's kind of where I fell in because uh, I'll give you a true story. So it was Christmas Eve of 2020. Our uh, oxygen vendor, I won't name the name, but they let us go drive. We ran out of oxygen and I'm in the second busiest ER in the entire state of California. We have about 143,000 visits a year. The ER is full. We have no oxygen cylinders. So, or no e-cylinders for the, for the gurney. So I'm there at midnight on Christmas Eve with eight cylinders running oxygen tubing along the ceiling to have drops at every gurney so patients can still have oxygen. If I would have said, no, I'm not coming in, I didn't add any value, but because I'm there <laughs> hanging oxygen to me like Christmas lights, that's how you're going to add value. You want to be that person that's going to be there for the organization when it matters most. Well, I think that's the big thing, guys, is I think uh, in regards to this, and, and Joe, you bring up a big thing. How, how do we maintain this post-COVID? I think I saw respiratory therapy mentioned on the news more time in two years than I had my entire career of, of 25 years, right? And I think that when we talk about RT directors, we put a lot of onus on, on RT directors across the country to, they've got to make that difference. They've got to make that known. They've got to, I think everybody owns that in the department, right? Uh, I think every therapist, every bedside therapist owns that responsibility uh, to keep that wave going uh, and how they interact with interdisciplinaries within the hospital, uh, how they represent their department, how they represent the hospital. And if a director can facilitate that culture and build that team, uh, then that's what makes a cohesive department in my mind. And that's where what I've seen across the country, when you have that chemistry, uh, you have therapists that do want to show up, that do want to make the proactive decision to be a, a, a piece of the team or a part of the team, and a director that knows how to coach and develop and, and nurture that, that makes that director's job so much easier year when they have to go to C-suite to talk about staffing, talk about new equipment, 
talk about expansions, talk about, uh, you know, whatever, right? I mean, would you agree, Joe? Well, absolutely. Um, and you get, you get invited more to other meetings. I mean, it will just grow from there. Mm -hmm. uh, and then, then you cannot forget to then take that value conversation you have the C-suite back to your staff. Mm -hmm. tell, them, tell them what just happened. Because sometimes staff only hear some, some bits and pieces, but uh, it's, it's up to us as leader then to circle back to staff and don't forget them that they are the reason why that they're making this value being noticed. We have to showcase that our profession. And I'm telling you, if, if we live on strictly CPT, RVU topic, which is a very important too, but we have to sustain this value. And I have, I have many tips on that, um, but that's, I think that, that is all, has always been the key. We just got to give the right tool, the right information, give the, the leaders out there the right, you know, what to look for, to then, then take that to the C-suite level. Exactly. Well, I think that's a great note to end on. Joe, you really bring kind of that, uh, kind of wrapped it all up there. And uh, again, we want to thank our production crew tonight, Jeff Maglin and Anna Hayes for uh, working behind the scenes to make this happen. Uh, also, thank you to Matt Pavlichko and Jonathan Butler, uh, my colleagues on here that are going to be uh, hosting this live weekly every Thursday. Uh, we're going to bring you shows from live events, as we've mentioned before. Uh, we covered a lot tonight. We covered a lot tonight. So if you heard something uh, within the chat or saw something within the chat, rather, or heard something in the conversation that you want to bring, bring that topic to us. And we will definitely spend an hour uh, diving deep into those um, those topics. Hey, John, um, thanks for the shout out there. We actually have Josh Good uh, available to give us a little teaser. So uh, Josh will be our November 3rd guest. Uh, Josh, if you want to introduce yourself to everyone. Um, but yeah, uh, thank you again. Hello, good evening. Uh, my name is Josh Good. I don't have clearly as uh, an exciting introduction as Matt, John, and Jonathan had. Um, but, you know, I'm just kind of here hanging out for the first time, seeing what uh, good work these guys uh, have done and everything going on here. Um, November 3rd, we uh, hope to be talking a little bit more about the uh, reduction of non-value added work. So we talked a little bit earlier about showing the value or getting rid of some of the things that completely are the waste of the respiratory therapist time. So they cannot do those value added things about some of the things that can be done and ways to implement those and even finding out from your frontline team about what can be done to get those things and barriers out of their way. So they're doing the right and important work at the right place at the right time. And I will tell you, Josh Good is being extremely humble. He is the waste cleaner. He does a fantastic job and did a great job. And if he didn't, his hospital would have been in big trouble. So uh, I cannot wait to pick his brain it's going to be exciting. Josh, thank you so much for introducing yourself, and we can't wait to talk to you in a few weeks. Yeah, Josh, Joe, thank you for joining us and uh, expanding and supporting our respiratory leadership community. Thank you so much. Okay, this is the part of the episode where I will uh, read the disclaimer, um, but feel free to sign off here. Uh, we got to make our lawyers happy. So Vapotherm does not practice medicine or provide medical services or advice. Any clinical recommendations provided herein are solely those of the speakers. Practitioners should refer to the full indications for use and operating instructions of any products references before use. Our hosts, Matthew Pavlichko, John Walsh, and Jonathan Butler are employees of Vapotherm. Thank you all for joining us tonight and enjoy the rest of your night.